This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of world-class software like PDF Pen for Mac, PDF Pen Pro for Mac, PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iPhone and iPad, Text Expander for Mac, and Text Expander for iPhone and iPad. Learn more about all their great products at smilesoftware.com. And by Mac Voices Magazine, our free Flipboard magazine that brings you some of the best Mac, iPhone, and iPad productivity tips on the web. High in signal, low in noise, just like Mac Voices, Mac Voices Magazine includes information on how you can get more out of your Apple technology. Subscribe at macvoices.com slash magazine or search for Mac Voices Magazine on Flipboard. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we haven't done a Mac Notables for a while. We haven't talked to Jason Snell for a while, but this time he's here. I don't know which hat he wears anymore. He wears so many. This time, I have a whole closet full of hats. Yeah, is that it? Okay, yeah. good, good. Uh, I'm looking forward to your what your Easter hat. How's that? Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, put on it. <laughs> Jason's here this time to talk about his book, uh, Photos, a Take Control Crash Course, which is, it's a new book, but it's kind of a, a, a new addition to an old book, and it's kind right. of a different addition to what, Jason? I, I get it's, confused. Yes, it's, it's, it's uh, so I wrote a book two years ago. Two years ago, year and a half ago, when uh, Apple released Photos, which was a weird thing. Apple released Photos during the, um, it, was, it was during the Yosemite era. It was before El Capitan. And uh, what they did was they um, they they released it in the spring and uh, and then they came out with a slight update to it in the fall when El Capitan came out. And so I wrote that book in the spring and we put it together and because it's a huge update, right, to taking to replacing iPhoto with photos. And uh, and we wrote the book and then we did the update when El Capitan came out. So this year with uh, with uh, Sierra coming out, we. We're looking at it and realize that so many of the major features uh, of photos are across platforms. That one of the things Apple's really trying to do with photos is make, you know, it's the same name, it's the same icon, it's a lot of the same features, is make the photos experience similar across all of their platforms. And we had debated it before. There's a little bit of iOS stuff in the earlier versions, but really one of the things about photos that is that is relevant and important is that there's photos on your phone and your iPad and your Mac and your Apple Watch and your Apple TV and I, we wanted the book to be able to cover all of those all those things so we took the name Mac out of the title although still I would say the primary platform we cover is the Mac because the Mac version of photos is the most powerful but all the other platforms are kind of mixed in there too, because you know most people I think are going to have, at the very least, they're going to be taking pictures on their iPhone and then syncing those by some means to their photos library. I, I don't want to get into the logistics of the book too much, but I will go this far. So, are you saying that if if you have a chapter on how to remove red eye, that you talk about how to remove red eye in each of the devices that you can remove red eye in? Yeah, and that's how it's structured. We decided to have it be basically, uh, I expanded a lot of the chapters to include the iOS versions as well as all the new features on the Mac because I didn't want to have like two or three books in one where there's like, here's the Mac book and then here's the photos book because a lot of the features are the same. So yes, the um, I'll give you an example. When you're editing, you can apply these effects that are like Instagram style filters to your photos. And those are the same. Uh, in the Mac and in iOS. And so that you get to them slightly differently on an iPad versus an iPhone versus a Mac, but they're the same filters. So rather than restate what all the filters are uh, several times in different chapters, here's the iOS version, here's the Mac version. We just said, here's the chapter about editing your photos. And then we talk about sort of the ways you do it on the different platforms. Okay, so that that's good. So that that way people can understand how the book is structured. Yeah, and you'll be surprised. I think a lot of Mac Mac users of Photos will be surprised at how many of the features do exist on the iPad and the iPhone. Like you know, there are certain things you can't do, but a lot of the features of Photos, in terms of editing your photos, processing your photos, you can do on your iPad. Uh, just as easily as you can do. Again, it's not 100%, but a lot of it is still there on the iPad and the iPhone that uh, you might be used to just on your Mac. What do you use to to process your photos? I love that that phrase because that can cover a, a wide range of uh, of adjustments to your photos. Well, I'm using photos 
um, mostly though, I mean, I wrote a book about photos, so I need to spend time using photos. So I committed fully to photos, uh, and I am I am using it. And the, I find the editing features really great. I mean, it's not Photoshop. It's not meant to be Photoshop or Lightroom. The touch up features, if you really need to like you know, remove somebody in the background, you probably want to take it out and do it somewhere else. But in terms of what most people want to do with photos, cropping, changing the color, changing the dynamic range, uh, you know, all of those things, there are lots of controls. There are are like more than a dozen different little sliders that you can, uh, and the sliders are not just doing one simple thing. Sometimes there's a, there's a, a slider called, I think it's called Vibrance, and it's like, what is that? And the answer is, it's a lot of different stuff happening in the background when you slide the slider. Apple just built this slider in order to um, let you slide it around and see if it makes your photo more pleasing or not. And there's a lot of complexity that's hidden behind it. So I think you can do a lot to crop and you know rotate and uh, change the look of your photos just in photos to get that look that you want. Change the white balance is a big one where I have photos that I took without a, a flash and everything's yellow because the lighting in the in the room was yellow and you know you a couple of clicks in photos and it looks like a natural uh, natural scene again instead of having the the big yellow cast on it so so I use I use photos on on my uh, phone as well you know if I'm sh shooting a photo and then I want to share it with somebody you know the editing features in, are in there so I can crop and apply an effect and look at the color and if you've got an iPhone 7 you know you're you're shooting in that you've got the wide color camera and the wide color display and then you can see that color while you're uh, making color adjustments in the edit and that's pretty cool too yeah, and I'm sorry, I'm, I misspoke. I, I kind of assumed that you'd be using photos if you wrote a book about it. I, I've, I, what I <laughs> was trying to ask is, what device do you, I mean, you oh. just answered part of that. Do you, do you yeah, typically it's revert? it's primarily the Mac. It's, it's primarily, primarily okay. the Mac because I've got a 5K iMac and it's enormous, and so I can see everything. But in, in the moment, and a lot of photography happens in the moment. In the moment, I, if I'm on my iPhone, then that's absolutely where, where I'll do it. I, what I don't do is process photos on the iPad a lot. And I came in writing the book, I came to really appreciate the fact that I have a, an iPad Pro, a 12.9 inch iPad Pro, the big one. And that's a pretty great photo editing device too, because again, you've got the big screen, you can see a lot of detail in the, in the photo while you're editing it. So I'm surprised I haven't really thought of that before. And I would probably consider um, using it for that workflow too, especially if I'm traveling, like, you know, again, at home, I've got the huge 27 inch iMac. That's pretty, pretty great. That's, that's the best I'm going to get. But if I'm traveling, I could see using the, uh, using the iPad pro more to do the same sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Jason, this is sort of a, a 30,000 foot question, but I still hear from people that, uh, more in the loss of iPhoto a little more recently, I hear from people that more in the loss of aperture, uh, as far as something that is being continually updated. Where does photo stand at this point in, in that particular continuum? I mean, I know it's been improved over its versions. Um, are we back to a, something closer to an aperture? Is it, are we back to some of the ease of use of iPhoto? Um, or is it, should we just stop doing those comparisons and look at it as a standalone? Uh, well, I'll tell you what we did for the book, which is we took out the first two editions of the Photos for MacBook were full of comparisons to iPhoto and Aperture, and we pulled them all out because I, I feel like the, that time has passed. And um, the uh, you know I understand when you have an app that you love and it ch it changes or it goes away and is replaced by something else that you're going to not like that. But I don't personal opinion. Um, I think photos is better than iPhoto in almost every way. It's different. And there are, yes, there are probably some very specific features that you could point to that if you love them uh, and then they're gone, you're going to be mad. Like if you gave star ratings to everything, well, now what you have to do is assign star based keywords because Apple got rid of star ratings and replaced it with a uh, simple favorite, a toggle uh, per photo of favorite. Apple and I, I was going to say Apple thinks. I think Apple knows that most of the users never had a uh, really use the star rating system. But if you did, that's a bummer, and I, I totally get it. So on the photo, on the iPhoto photo side, I would say if you're holding out, I would say uh, you know give it a look, consider it. You can always import your photo iPhoto library to photos and ba go back to iPhoto if you need to. It doesn't destroy your photo library. It marks it as imported. So that if you open it inadvertently, it says, did you know you already, you know, you don't want to do this. You, you already opened it in photos. But if you're 
uh, if you're determined to just go back to iPhoto, it'll let you. It's fine. Um, but I would say try it out because it's got a lot of functionality that uh, photo that iPhoto doesn't have, and it's a lot faster. And I love the cloud syncing features. You know, they're not for everybody, but I think it's pretty great that I have access to my photo library on all my devices. Um, Aperture is a very different story. Apple, when they made the announcement of Photos, they made a claim that Photos was going to be the replacement for iPhoto and Aperture. And I think... I think maybe there was a moment when Apple thought that there would be more professional uh, level features like uh, enough for them to claim that Aperture could go away and Photos could replace it. And yeah, I think even Apple backed away from that. They, they made that one statement and then, and then I think never addressed the issue again. And, you know, I don't think – I wonder what the percentage is. I think there's a percentage of Aperture users who just wanted a little more – than um, iPhoto could give them. And they might be okay with Photos, especially since Photos supports extensions. So there are a bunch of extra editing plugins, basically, that come, that work inside Photos now. If you want to get them from the Mac App Store, there are a bunch. Um, but for the people who use Aperture because they want to manage their files, you can manage your files in the file system and keep them in Photos, but it's not the greatest. I... I guess what I'm saying is I think for most Aperture users, if they're serious, like power users of Aperture, Lightroom is the answer, not Photos. It, and you're going to need to – basically, you're going to need to choose at some point when you decide that it's too too late and you need to leave Aperture. Lightroom from Adobe is the one that is – the does sort of like – Everything that Aperture did and more to a you know to a certain extent, I'm sure. Again, there's a little feature here or there that somebody will be like, I love this feature and it's gone, and that may be true, but um, but uh, you know, but Photos is not, Photos is for for you know the general public audience, and Aperture was never really meant for that, and um, and iPhoto wasn't meant for that. So I think Photos is truly the follow-on of iPhoto. If you want to think of it as iPhoto 10 with an X, that's basically what it is. And then Aperture is just discontinued. And I think Lightroom, people should try out Lightroom. And fo the Lightroom Photoshop bundles $100 a year from Adobe. And I know people don't love subscription software and people don't love Adobe. But if you're a serious photographer, who somebody who cares enough about their photos to to go through the all the detail work of using Aperture, I think you owe it to yourself to at least give the Lightroom Photoshop bundle a try um, because that's probably going to be a better fit for you if you really need those features. I'm, I'm glad you brought up extensions. Uh, that that was one of the interesting things for me was to see if this market was going to develop. And part of me says, okay, this is a, one approach that Apple could be taking, and and we're seeing it in photos of saying, okay, here's a here's a a consumer or a high level consumer product that then you can turn into something a bit more if you want to spend a little bit more money and a little bit more time and use those features. I mean, to be fair to, to Adobe, sort of like uh, Photoshop uh, Express is. Photoshop Express? No, I don't have that right. But Photoshop LE? LE, yes. Thank you. I think that is it. Um, with as opposed to, you know, or Photoshop full... Elements now, I guess. Elements, well, we're, Elements. We're, we're, we've walked through all of the names that Adobe used for it, but it's Elements yes, but it's is a, what it is. And, it, it's, and it's got most of Photoshop in it. It's yeah. Simplified. It, but it, for example, it doesn't have like the, 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 the color separations and those kind of things. Exactly. Right. So, those are the pro features. And, and how many times have you used color separations, Jason? I mean, I, I have. I, yes, I can count it on one hand. And uh, mostly it's somebody sends me a CMYK file and I want it to be RGB. And then that's the end of it. So, right. yeah. Yeah, so I, I think there's there's a place for some of this stuff. Adobe chose to do it by having two separate products. Apple may be choosing to do it by saying, here it is. And for those of you who want to play in that space, you know, by all means, code it yourself. Go out and find somebody to code it and then offer it for sale. Yeah, or, or you know, it's not Apple's job to support every market and uh, every feature and every user. It's just not. It's not. And Apple... I think there's a larger conversation that we could have at some point about whether Apple should even be in the pro app business. But, um, and I say that as a person who uses logic and final cut pro, um, but they seem so tangential to Apple's core business now. Um, and aperture was like that too. And unlike final cut pro and logic, which have a lot of, I think a really dedicated user base, I think aperture never really caught on, as much and had really tough competition from Adobe. 
And it's not like Logic and, and, and Final Cut don't have tough competition too, but they, I think they have a more dedicated user base maybe than Aperture did. And that when they, it came time to decide what, where to spend resources, Apple said, this is not a market where we can we can excel, we're going to just drop out. And so they dropped out. And that that is literally what has happened here, is Apple has said, we can't make a product for that, a certain class of uh, of uh, photographer. And that's just how it is. So that, that uh, I, photos... I think photos should not be judged as a replacement for aperture because it's not even trying to be that, and it's not, and it's not. The extensions are nice, but it's not the same because it's it, that's one little piece of the puzzle. And aperture was a was really a different mindset than iPhoto, and and photos has the iPhoto mindset mostly. Yeah, and and your point about the I think the the vibrant sliders while we were talking about that, there's a lot of intelligence that is going on underneath some of these controls, so that you don't have to have it. You don't have to have the experience of, you know, whatever those twenty five variables are that make right. up vibrance. And I got it wrong. It's brilliance is brilliance? the name of it. Okay. What is brilliance? What is that? And the answer is it's lots of stuff that changes, and yeah. you don't even like don't even ask. It's just brilliance. Okay. Right. Slide it and see what happens. <laughs> Slide it and see exactly. Yeah. And and if you if you feel the need to find out what those twenty five variables are, there are products out there that, not within photos, that you can go and play with all that stuff. But yeah. at the end of the day, that's that is such a small group of people, and that that's that's exactly right. I mean, the stars thing is the is the best example, which is even something like iPhoto rating your star, things with three, four, five stars. Apple looked at and said, nobody does that. And I know there are people who do it, but Apple probably knows that it was a fraction of a percent of people. And if you're one of those people, it's really sad that that feature's not there. There are workarounds. But I think Apple Apple decided for the most part, you know, faving or not faving a photo is enough. Just saying, I'm going to mark this. I'm going to give it a heart is that is and, – and you know what? Most people won't do that either. But that's a simplification – uh, recognizing that that with the photo libraries that we've got, people are not dwelling on these photos. And if you're the kind of person who dwells on all your photos and every time you shoot any photos, you immediately go back and you categorize them and you keyword them and you label them and all those things, then yeah, it's kind of a downer. But what Apple's saying is almost nobody does that and we're not going to build our product for the the small group of people who do that. There can you know You can find another product if you want to. Everybody out there that has gone through all that tagging and keywording and all that stuff, raise your hands right now. I, I see three of you. You know, it's I just, I used to do it and I, I gave up. Exactly. And, and and it's funny. I mean, that, that's actually a good segue. One of the biggest features in macOS Sierra and in iOS 10 is this machine learning stuff. And the whole idea there is you don't have time or the inclination to tag your photos, so the computer or phone will do it for you. And I think that's a great feature for so many reasons but the number one reason is i'm not going to sit down and do what i did for a couple of years when my kids were pretty little which is mark everything with keywords and what the trip was and all of that it's like at this point the computer and the phone need to do that for me the the i need data when it's captured and uh when it's analyzed and then let me search for it later but don't make me sit down and go photo by photo and say is my daughter in this photo is the dog in this photo is this from our trip to that lake I don't want to do that anymore. And the new features allow you to kind of not worry about it. And there seems to be something, just so, since we're on that topic, it seems to be so important at that moment. And yet five years, two years, a year, two years, five years down the road, it's the photo that's important. It's the, the memory that it captured. It's not necessary that you knew what the address was of, of where you were. It just, right. you, you know, you were in Washington, D.C. That, that, that's enough. And if you're a human being, as we all are, you're probably going to be inconsistent with your tagging. <laughs> and that is actually the thing that's surprised me the most about using these machine learning uh, uh, categories that Apple has Apple is generating with photos, which is it's finding photos that I I mean, I remember them, but I haven't looked at them. And some of that is because these are photos that didn't get put in an album or they didn't get tagged right. Or I was really tired that day and I didn't tag them and they're just kind of lost. But Apple's algorithm looks at every single photo in your library and tags it. And so th then there's that moment where you think, I wonder if I have photos of cows and yeah, it turns out I have a lot of photos of cows. <laughs> How about that? And that that's pretty magical. 
and you know, I know Apple gets mocked for using that word, but I would use it here. It's the fact that your photo library um, knows itself better than you know it, even though you were there and took those pictures. That's pretty great. And you know, that that is something that is going to be better than it, all but the most diligent photo tagger. And now we're talking about one, you know, one tenth of one tenth of one percent of people who are who are going through and saying this has got cows and this has got mountains and this is on this trip and it's got these people in it. Like people, nobody does that, but Apple's software can do it, and it does. Any tips that that are in the book about how? You can maybe assist that, or is is it just it's the way it is for right now, and it's only going to get better when Apple reprograms things? It's a black box, okay. so it really is just running on its own. I, what I would say is I, I've heard from some people saying it makes me uncomfortable that Apple's looking at my photos. And I guess, you know, if you if you missed it, the, this is the story. Is Apple's not looking at your photos. Apple has trained its software by looking at publicly available photos, photos that it's licensed, wh wherever it's gotten them. It's used other photos to learn to build up this learning algorithm about about identifying items in photos um, all that runs on your if you're if you're on a mac with a bunch of photos on it and you're not on the internet it scans your photos it doesn't need the internet it doesn't talk to apple it doesn't send data back to apple about this stuff it's all resident so so apple's not looking at your photos your mac is looking at your photos just like it used to when it was using the faces feature to try to identify faces it's all happening locally and for that reason if you upgrade to photos for sierra um you probably should leave your Mac on overnight for a couple of days because it will churn. It, it will analyze every single photo that you've got, and that takes time. And if you upgraded to iOS 10 and noticed that it was kind of warm when you picked it up in the morning, one of the reasons is it was actually cranking across all those photos overnight. Um, one of the weaknesses of photos right now is that Apple? I think it was such a big thing for them to bite off that they um, that they couldn't do what is the obvious next step, which is that if a photo is processed on one device, that in information should get synced to the other devices, and the other devices should be told you don't need to work on this one. I got it. I took care of it. And um, right now, it doesn't do that. Right now, if you've got three different Macs and five different iOS devices all attached to the same photo library, guess what? They all will scan those photos and use energy and throw off heat to do so. And you know, hopefully next year, they'll do a software update that, that cloud syncs more of that data because it's not a private privacy issue because it's all your personal encrypted photo library information. And uh, it would certainly make things easier. But right for right now, it's just device by device. It's scanning those photos and uh, and learning. And Apple doesn't know. Apple trained it, sent it off into the world, and now it works for you. Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Smile, the makers of world class software. Software like PDF Pen, available in various flavors for Mac and iOS, PDF Pen Scan Plus for iOS, and Text Expander for Mac and iOS. Get all the details at smilesoftware.com. Are you among the many Apple users who find themselves doing more and more on your iPhone and iPad? Smile has you covered with iOS versions of their productivity apps so that you get the Smile experience no matter what Apple hardware is at your fingertips. Text Expander for iPhone and iPad delivers powerful text expansion in the form of an iOS keyboard. Dropbox or Text Expander syncing makes sure that all the snippets you carefully created for your desktop Mac are also available, and because it's a keyboard, it works in virtually any iOS app. PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad boasts the drawing, highlighting, and text correction you would expect, along with form signatures and completion, object resizing, and more. Dropbox Storage and Sync makes sure that when you get back to your Mac, all your work will be available, ready for the next step. PDF Pen for iOS even features palm rejection and support for Bluetooth pens like Apple's Pencil. But we're not done yet. PDF Pen Scan Plus puts a scanner in your iPhone or iPad, so the power to capture, edit, and even run optical character recognition on those scans is in the palm of your hand. Documents can then be synced with a variety of cloud services for safekeeping and access from your desktop. All that makes Smile software just as important on your iPhone and iPad as it is on your Mac. Which is really no surprise, since that's exactly what you would expect from Smile, the makers of world-class software. Find Text Expander for iPhone and iPad, PDF Pen for iPhone and iPad, and PDF Pen Scan Plus all on the iOS App Store, 
or visit smilesoftware.com for more information on all of the essential smile products. That's smile at smilesoftware.com. Productivity apps for all of your Apple devices. Thanks to Smile for their ongoing support of Mac Voices. All right, so we've, we've gone down a bunch of different places here just in general conversation. What are some of the things that you've put in the book that maybe weren't there before? I know that you did some consolidation. You've cut a few things out. But but what is new in the book that, uh, that, that this version of photos or this version of the photos book justified? Well, it's it, a lot of it is uh, what we've been talking about. It's how you search using those new features, how you um, identify people. Because the the people interface is very different from the old faces interface. Um, where the machine learning stuff pops out and how you get to it, working around some of the limitations, like you can't say, "Show me a picture of my daughter and cows." Um, it doesn't work that way. You, it just you you get one. So instead, you know, there's a workaround. You you search for cows and you put those in an album, and then you search for the you know you make a smart you make a smart uh, album that searches the contents of that album. Uh, and also my daughter's face and then boom, you got, you got it. So you got to do a little more work because they haven't put those features in. So there's stuff like that about like how do you, how to access and take advantage of the fact that Apple has, has brought that in. So that's a big one. Um, what else? Uh, there's some stuff. I, I took a lot of screenshots of maps in this one because one of the nice things, um, that, that Apple has added in, in photos is, is, um, one of the things that kept people, uh, on iPhoto was that you could view everything arbitrarily just sort of like on a map, show all my photos on a map. And photos took that away. Photos could show little groups of photos on a map, but not the whole library. And there's now a places album in photos. It will show every photo you've got on a map, uh, which is pretty great. But also if you're in any other kind of context, it keeps showing you a little, a little map square of like, I could show you, you know, photos that you took around here. Um, and that's, that's pretty cool. So that, that's a lot better. So we go into that a lot. And then, um, the other major feature in photos for iOS 10 and Sierra is this thing called memories and going back to how it knows your library better than you do. You do one of the, the ways that memories, memories is a arbitrary collection of photos that it thinks are related and that you might want to see. And that seems kind of random, but it's using all of that metadata, all the information that the, that the machine learning algorithm mined from your photos. It's, it knows when, you know, it knows photo data. It knows when it was taken and where it was taken, but it also knows who's in the picture, what, you know, what's the, uh, what other objects are in the picture. It knows all of that. So, Memories end up being, um, it can be things like, here's the best of last month, but it can also be like, here's a trip you took two years ago. Um, it can also be things like, uh, here are, here are pictures of you at ballparks. That's one that I saw. There was one that was called, um, uh, being together and it was pictures of my kids and their grandparents. And it had just grabbed a bunch of pictures of my kids and their grandparents over many years and put it together. And this is all possible because it has all of this information about what's interrelated. And then Apple has programmed in a bunch of different like things for it to try in terms of, you know, connecting faces and, and uh, similar places and uh, objects and uh, anniversaries and recent trips and things like that. And it's all kind of mixed together. The net result is when you go to the memories tab, um, it's surfacing great photos that you would otherwise never look at because you've got thousands of photos in your library. And that photo of your daughter's birthday party from eight years ago is just, you're never going to look at that again, but it recognizes something and says, here's a, here's an interesting memory. And all of a sudden, I mean, I'll tell you, Chuck, I was overcome with emotion more than once while writing this book because it kept throwing pictures of my life at me it about my kids as babies about my dad before he died like so many so many memories and but you know what that's what I, I think it's a great feature because we take these photos to remember and then there are too many photos for us to look at and memories uh memory memories pulls those all out and then at the bottom of every memory not only is there a map but there are related memories and those are even more nuts because those are based on the contents of of this memory, here are some things that we think are related. And so like, if I, if I have, 
a picture, uh, a bunch of pictures of my daughter. One of the things with, with friends of hers at some event, one of the things will be uh, a bunch of pictures of those, my daughter and those friends together. And another one will be other events we went to at that location. And it, it just keeps on going. So you can really just dive into your, your own memory bank of your photo library. It's pretty amazing. And it wouldn't work without the machine learning stuff on top because that's how it knows. And it seems like, and I've had limited ex limited experience with what you've obviously spent a lot more time with, but it's just got to get better. I mean, what it does already now, people say, well, it missed this or it missed that. Yeah, this is, you know, one of the first iterations of this. I mean, come on, you know, it, but we're all anxious to have it be just picture perfect that every single picture of your daughter will pop up. And it's not probably not going to accomplish that, but it's going to accomplish so much. And it's and what it is accomplishing is very useful. Yeah, yeah, it's going to get better. Um, machine learning is really in its infancy. It's going to get a lot better. Google, I mean, if you look at Google Photos, if you upload your photos to Google Photos, Google's got this too. Google's doing its processing up in the cloud, and there are privacy issues, and people get bothered by that. But you can see the results of that too, and it's very impressive. And there is, I remember reading a science fiction novel, uh, like a couple probably a couple decades ago. And one of the plot points was that it was identifying where people were through, through um, them showing up in the background of other people's vacation photos. And the idea was like in the future, we'll be able to scan all the photos and, the, and we'll know who everybody, what everybody's faces look like. And we'll be able to find them. Even if like somebody just posted this photo of their, their trip to Paris, look, there's the guy we're looking for. He's in the background in Paris. When was that taken? And it sounds very sci-fi thriller kind of thing, but we're practically there at this point. This is other than privacy issues of scanning everybody's photos and Google is working on that. <laughs> um, but we're, we're at that point now where, um, our photos will be connected together in ways that maybe we would will even surprise us and if you wanted to share your photos i think one of the other frontiers of this is sharing if you want to share your photos with your friends and your family right now there's sort of this issue of privacy of like what do i want to actually share with them but i i you know in the future you're going to be able to say you know we take we we take vacations and visit my aunt and uncle and sometimes we meet them places i'd like to share my photos of those uh, you know when we're with my aunt and uncle with them and Instead of having to make a library or make a smart album or do something like that, all I'll have to do is say, I want to share. I mean, Apple could build this today, probably, and they will, I think, at some point. I want to share with my aunt and uncle the photos that we have in common and just leave it at that. And it knows, based on their appearance and the timestamp and the location, they will be able to judge which photos that we should share together because they're relevant to our common experience. And that's amazing, right? So... I think that's all all to come now that we have this amount of information and that we can sort of sync things up with the cloud and share them. I'm glad you mentioned the Google thing and the privacy. That is because you've mentioned that in a couple different contexts here. And that's a, a key thing here that these are your photos and they are not they're not for public viewing unless you opt to make them that way, even if you upload them to iCloud. Apple really does try to maintain your privacy, whereas Google, if I remember correctly, even their terms of service have something to do with it being visible or shared or... Yeah, I mean, it's not Google's intent for other people to see your private photos, but the fact remains that although they're sent encrypted to Google servers, they are decrypted on Google servers, and that's how Google processes them. So if there was a security flaw or a Google... I mean, the ultimate example would be a, a, a bad Google employee who decided to use machine learning to find um, all the photos of naked people and uh, or a hacker who did that and then and then blackmailed people. I mean, there's so many different ways that it could go wrong. And, and although I'm a little skeptical of um, kind of a Google panic about privacy, the fact is. Google's whole system is engineered for unencrypted copies of your data to reside on uh, or unencryptable, maybe I could say, unencrypted or unencryptable copies of your data on Google servers, which means like if there's a bad actor or a hack or anything, they've got your data. And iCloud, uh, you know, not all cloud services are the same. iCloud, it's all encrypted on Apple servers. So Apple servers have it and it's a repository for your information. So it's available in the cloud, but you have the keys and Apple doesn't. That's the idea. Apple doesn't have the keys. Apple doesn't want the keys. Apple doesn't want to get a, a, a subpoena from a judge that says they have to unlock this data. The idea is it's your data. You have the keys. Apple doesn't. 
And that's the difference. And, you know, if that matters to you, that's a reason to use Apple services instead of Google services. Google services are very good and it doesn't matter to a lot of people, but it's something that you should be aware of before you make that decision. Google services are also a lot cheaper, but that's the, you know, you're, you're, you pay and you get better privacy with Apple stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's wise words because unfortunately you do see things popping up uh, on the sidebar of your Gmail or whatever that seem oddly related to conversations you've recently had. Yeah, well, that, that's because I mean it's algorithmic. It's not like super creepy, but it's because they can their algorithm can scan your stuff. That's yeah, right. absolutely. So they know a lot about you, even uh -huh. whether you want it to, want them to, don't want them to, or whether it doesn't matter to you, they still know it. Yeah, and that's that, right because that's their business. Yeah, exactly. Um, to just go one more thing into the machine learning, have you do you believe that if you feed it more photos, it gets more intelligent? It gets say better at recognizing your daughter's face or recognizing cows uh basically no uh, that the downside of this is that what apple's doing is educating it elsewhere and then sending you a robot that has learned what it's learned and you can't educate it and say no this is actually a cow you should learn that this is a cow i that may come at some point that may actually happen that's going to require a lot of changes in apple's infrastructure they're going to have to um find ways for you to submit uh, images and say, you know, you didn't get this right, which, you know, uh, which is you opting into sending Apple a photo, but still that, you, you know, that's going to be a change for them. Um, in terms of faces, it's not really true. In terms of faces, it recognizes a bunch of different faces. And what you're really doing is merging all of those faces together. So if it recognized for my daughter, because she, you know, the photo library spans her entire life, her face when she's three and five and seven and nine and 11 and 13 and 15, those are all different faces. What it lets me do is select them all and mer and say merge them together into one person and it knows that's Jamie and it's got all the pictures of Jamie. Uh, but it's an ongoing process and other people, you'll get duplicates with other people and basically you just stick them together. So what's not happening, you're not really educating it about a person's face. What you're really saying is you're aggregating a bunch of face objects detected by the robot and saying, these all make this person and this is who this person is. And, uh, it's a fine point, but it's not, not quite the same as educating it. I think, you know, for educating it, it's got to go back. The photo has got to go back to the algorithm and Apple is not doing that right now. Apple doesn't want to, you know, Apple doesn't want to do that. We almost have to define the word educate because it felt like with in iPhoto in the old versions of iPhotos that if you if you gave it more examples of say your daughter's face uh, and without some of the changes of course uh, that come with age, but it would get better at it. It was, might. And it might have. I mean, this. I think this is a different. Uh, it's a well. I know this is a completely different algorithm, and that one may have been adjusting, or it may have just been aggregating behind the scenes. I don't know. But this is a completely different one. And as far as I can tell, you know, there are no adjustments really going on. You're just aggregating more. But the the effect is the same, right? If you if you take sort of like twenty face models for a person and say these are all this person, then you're casting a pretty wide net. When it finds another photo of that person, it's going to look and say, well. It, it looks like um, it's in this bucket, so this is probably who that is. Yeah, yeah. What else do we need to know about photos and using photos to take control crash course? Uh, we've covered the main highlights. I guess the other thing I would just say is that you know I, I try to go into how this works on iOS 10, on the iPad and the iPhone, and those are a little bit different. And then we venture into some other platforms. So uh, this is with with watch uh, with watch OS. Um, there's a little uh, photos app on there and it doesn't do a whole lot, but it will sync photos to your Apple watch and you can use them there. So I, I, I go into that. I got to put a couple of Apple watch screenshots in the book and Apple TV, I think is really interesting. Apple TV really lagged behind when the fourth generation Apple TV came out. It's support for iCloud photo library, which had already been out for more than six months was basically non-existent, which was really disappointing because that's one of the nice things about having, um, having all these platforms together is you can look at your stuff on all the platforms. And we didn't have that. So instead, um, they, not instead, they finally came out with one. So the, the new version of the Apple TV operating system that came out along with iOS 10 and Sierra has a Photos app that really does let you view memories and it lets you view albums and it lets you view your photos 
in the iCloud photo library. So if you use iCloud photo library to sync your photos, um, Apple TV will actually let you do that. And so for that part of the book, not only did I get to, you know, I, I got to write about Apple TV stuff, which is interesting, but I had to figure out how to take pictures of Apple TV stuff, which <laughs> is a ridiculous process that involves attaching uh, a, a USB-C cable to a Mac and capturing video of the USB or of the of the uh, of the Apple TV's display via USB-C and then pulling frames out of the video. It's really weird and hard to do, and it's not meant for regular people. But you're writing a book about Apple TV, you got to do it. So I did that. But the Apple TV stuff is much better. So that and that all rolled into why we decided to just call it Photos uh, Crash Course instead of Photos for Mac because Apple really does want this to be across all its platforms, and it kind of is now finally. And and I think at this point it's a good time to say or remind folks, Apple Apple's no longer just dealing with Mac OS or iOS. Now we have Mac OS, iOS, Watch OS, TV OS. Yep. You know, who knows what we might have? You know, yeah. I mean, and the iPhone and iPad versions are distinctly different too. So yeah, yeah. different flavors. So you know, it, it it's a, it is a lot to keep up with and try to keep parity with. And at some point. Yep. You know, it, you just got to get stuff out there, let people use it, and something is going to lag behind. In this case, it was the Apple TV. Maybe yeah. next time it'll be an iOS version. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a quite a challenge they've taken on. So. Yeah, it it is. You know, when Photos is a good example of Apple doesn't build products for a platform. Apple builds products for its ecosystem. That, I think that's the modern Apple. That's how Apple would like all of its products to behave. It, it's not true for all products, but I think Photos shows their ambition, which is Photos is a platform unto itself, and it runs on iCloud and Mac and iOS and tvOS and watchOS. And that's that's what they want is, is, you know, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's photos. It's not just an app on your Mac. We could go on on for a long time because there's so many things I'd love to cover. But let's just get tell people where they can go get the book and let them go get the book and start working on it for themselves. All right. Well, you can go to takecontrolbooks.com and look for the photos book. You can find it there. That's a great place to do it. Okay. And the price is? $10. 10, ten measly dollars. Ten dollars cheap. To That's learn, right. To learn all this stuff that Jason spends so much time uh, putting together. Yeah, and it's it's a crash course format, so it's pretty visual. There are lots of screenshots, and it's not um, it's not one of those kind of computer books where you've got paragraph after paragraph, like just text and more text and more text. It really is um, a very interesting format that Adam and Tanya Angst have come up with. That is really boiled down. Um, lots of screenshots with call outs and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of nitty gritty detail. So it's uh, it's pretty no nonsense. And I, I like that about the format. It's not I think I think most people do not enjoy like leaning back and reading pages and pages and pages of text about a, a computer. Um, and it, it, it's so it's more it's more uh, manual like and boiled down to the essentials in that way. Yeah, I, I think those days of the of the manuals or the replacement manuals or the restatement of manuals are pretty much gone. Are over. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Too many dead trees out there. Mm -hmm. And this is not a dead tree. This is electronic. So, folks, that's right. Go get it. Put it. Put on your iPad. Put it on your Mac. Yep. It's Sa there. Save a tree. Mm -hmm. Jason, we got to do it more often. Thanks so much for uh, for taking the time. Thanks for a great photos book. I'm I've, I've looked at it. and I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more about photos because I don't use nearly enough of the power it has. Well, it's a it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad uh, I'm glad you got the book, and I'm glad that Apple did a you know this is a major update. We when I started this process, it was basically the 1.0, and now we're we finally reached 2.0 where there's a bunch of new stuff, and it was exciting to go through and do a a proper uh, revision to cover all the all the new stuff that was in there. It was exciting. It was a an exciting summer of uh, looking at lots of photos, <laughs> an emotional summer, right? Mm -hmm, for sure. Okay, so this now it's quiz time because I want to make sure that folks know you're hardly just a take control author. You do a lot of stuff. You do a lot of podcasts. I do. Give us a rundown if you can. All right, you can find my writing at sixcolors.com, which is my website about all things Apple and otherwise, and I do that with Dan Morin. And then on the podcast front, on Relay FM, you can listen to me uh, talk to Mike Hurley on Upgrade. Dan Morin and I welcome a couple of special guests every week on Clockwise. I talk every other week about space with Liftoff. I talk about being an independent worker with David Sparks on uh, on free agents. 
And that's Relay. And then at The Incomparable, I host The Incomparable Podcast, which is weekly. Uh, you can also listen to me on things like Robot or Not, TV Talk Machine. Uh, what else is going on there? Total Party Kill, a game show. Uh, there are others. So, uh, yeah, I'm a, but The Incomparable.com, Relay FM, and SixColors.com. That's really all you need to know. Just find me there. Wow. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I, we will get it, do it again soon. And I, I just, I always hate to invite you because I know you either have to give up sleep or food to be on the show because you're it so happens. busy. But so. it's a, it's a pleasure. Um, anytime. All right. Let's do it more got often. It. You got it. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Again, Jason Snell has authored photos, a Take Control Crash Course. Got to get it right. Yep. Go to TakeControlBooks.com. Check it out. Do more with your photos. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for show notes, links to subscribe, and to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, SoundCloud, the Mac Voices blog, the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter, and on Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard that helps you do more with your Apple tech. Advertising handled by BackBeatMedia at BackBeatMedia.com. Bandwidth provided by CashFly at CashFly.com.